This week on Christian World News, miraculous survival. See how Syrian Christians in one ancient community are over overcoming Islamic persecution. If you think indecent, radically sexual behavior is what you want to do, that's your choice. But if I think that this is an embarrassing sin, I want to remain in society which is allowed to say that. Plus, we'll show you how the people in one country, the country of Georgia, are fighting for family values. And battling loneliness with love. See how churches in China are ministering to senior citizens in the country. Hello everyone, welcome to this week's edition of Christian World News. I'm George Thomas. My colleague Wendy Griffith is on assignment. Rape beheadings and destruction. ISIS and other militant Islamists are committing genocide against Middle East Christians, yet miraculously the people of one of the world's oldest Christian cities have survived. Gary Lane traveled to Malula, Syria and found that preserving the town's Christian heritage came with a heavy cost. Welcome to Malula, an ancient Christian city where the people still speak Aramaic, the language of Jesus. Located 35 miles northeast of the Syrian capital city of Damascus, Islamic terrorists overran and occupied Malula in September 2013. Because of Malula's ancient history, it has become a symbol of Christianity. That's why the Islamic extremists wanted to control it, because it was this symbol for all of Syria. And that's why it was important for the Assad regime to control it again. The Syrian army fought aggressively and liberated Malula eight months after the terrorists seized control. But the town had already suffered much hardship and destruction. Militants left St. George's Church here in Malula largely intact, but they did their damage to the interior, like to some of these ancient church icons. The terrorists tried to erase Malula's Christian heritage by shooting up icons. They used knives to desecrate a depiction of the Last Supper. They knocked down this Jesus statue and broke it into pieces. And the terror inflicted on human lives proved even more devastating. They came here to convert the Christians to Islam and they wanted to destroy Malula because it's Christian. They shouted Allahu Akbar. They were from Chechnya, Egypt, Libya, from everywhere, Tunis, Algeria. They came with long hair, long beards and scary faces. Maryam El Zakam was at home when Islamic militants armed with automatic weapons and grenades approached her doorstep. They attacked my house and started screaming, come out you Christian pigs. I knew they planned to take our daughters, rape and kill them. So I thought of killing my daughters and then myself before they could get to us. I then prayed to God instead and asked him to give us a chance to leave the house. Maryam and her family escaped out a back door just moments before the jihadists stormed into their home. Father Tuthakid is the parish priest of St. George's Greek Melkite Catholic Church. We had a lot of fear, in fact, in that time, and people uh, began to leave Malula, in fact. Six young people, in fact, kidnapped, and we, know, we don't know anything about them, in fact. They also kidnapped 15 nuns who spent three months in captivity before they were freed in a prisoner exchange. Other Christians, however, were not so fortunate. Maryam's nephew Sarkis and two other men hid in the cellar of this house. The jihadists called out to them, pledging they would not be harmed if they surrendered. When they refused to convert to Islam, they were killed, three of them. In a show of support for the Christians of Malula, Syrian President Bashar al-Assad toured the town in April 2014. He walked through the rubble of damaged homes, monasteries and church buildings. He pledged to help restore Malula to its ancient beauty. The government felt it was important to care for the Christians and show their caring for the Christians. Of course, of course, not only because they are Christians, but because Malula became in the past a symbol, a symbol of the Christianity itself and the symbol of the living together between Christians and Muslims. That's why Malula was important and that's why it was attacked. Restoration efforts continue at St. Sarkis Monastery. It's one of the oldest monasteries in all of Christendom. This is how it looked days after the terrorists were chased from Malula. And here it is today. The monastery chapel remains intact. Built in the fourth century on the ruins of a pagan temple, it predates the Council of Nicaea in 325 AD. 
Missing today are 16th and 18th century icons, which once adorned the chapel walls. The jihadists may have either sold or destroyed them. And Miriam says the terrorists could have easily massacred Malula's Christians, but God intervened. I believe prayer had an effect. By your prayers, we were protected. While many buildings have been restored, it will take longer for the people to rebuild their lives. My daughter has nightmares and screams in the middle of the night. They're coming to kill us. While Father Tufik remains optimistic, he knows the Christians of Malula still face many challenges as fighting continues in their country. We are rising again. We are rising again. This is a step of faith, in fact, to have hope. Pray for us to have hope, more hope, because the difficulties are so, so much. Pray that God will not only restore peace to Malula, but to all of Syria. <laughs> Gary Lane, CBN News, Malula, Syria. Thanks, Gary. So, what is driving the for what is the driving force rather behind this murderous persecution? Recently, CBN's Mark Martin asked Jeff King of International Christian Concern why the Islamic State is trying to destroy Christianity in the Middle East. Radical extremists from Islam have always tried to destroy Christianity. Uh, basically, their first drive is to enslave it. If not, they'll crush it. You know, but with with the uh, with ISIS and the various groups, they're trying to create an Islamic caliphate, and that's across the Middle East. It's had devastating results. Now, you know, if you look back, it's not just ISIS. Uh, it's the Taliban. It's Al Qaeda. You know, it's one group after another. But it's radical Islam. These are fundamentalists. They're trying to recreate. Uh, what Muhammad started. Give us an idea how many Christians have fled the region and how many are left. If you look at Iraq, in 2003, there were 1.25 million Christians, a million and a quarter Christians, and now there's 250,000. Christians are obviously unwelcome, they're being targeted, and they're voting with their feet. So they're going anywhere they can. A lot of them are coming to the States, uh, Europe, etc. cetera. But uh, Islam, radical and fundamentalist Islam, a more hostile environment are a huge part of it. Could ISIS be successful in wiping Christianity out from the region? It's possible. Uh, I don't think that's going to happen. There's, there's a remnant. There's going to be a remnant. And unfortunately, maybe we're really already down to that. You know, when you talk about that, that drop in numbers from one and a quarter million down to a quarter million, that's a massive drop. But uh, the tide is starting to turn on ISIS. But it seems like, at least in Syria and in Iraq, they're getting restricted. They're, uh, we're pushing back. Jeff, unfortunately, this is not happening just in the Middle East. Where else is this happening? If you look at Nigeria, you know, Boko Haram and the Fulani militants have had a devastating effect. They've killed at least 50,000 Christians in the last 10 years, and they don't get nearly the headlines. It's kind of a strange phenomenon. Um, but, you know, that's the big story. It's radical Islam all over the world. So that's the headline grabbers. But it's really beyond that. I mean, China is led by a hardliner right now. And there was a, a woman defending her church that was being bulldozed. There's a government campaign against churches. They bulldoze them. They destroy them. They tear off the crosses. Uh, and this woman was defending her church, and she was actually bulldozed and buried alive. Uh, look, at, uh, look at India. India is led by a hardliner. He's a Hindu hardliner. Very hostile towards Christianity. His party is hostile towards Christianity. They're violent and oppressive. There's a whole region that uh, where Christianity was actually uh, declared illegal. Jeff King with International Christian Concern. Thank you, Jeff. Thank you so much. By the way, politicians, sorry, politicians, missionaries and members of the persecuted church will gather in Washington, D.C. this summer to focus on the disappearing church in the Middle East. It's called the, Br the Bridge. And to learn more, you can go to our website, cbnnews.com. Uh, as I was going to say, persecution isn't just happening in the Middle East. Christians in a Pakistani village recently were given two options, convert to Islam or die. Now more than 100 Christian families have reportedly fled after mobs of radical Muslims started torching homes there. The violence started when a Muslim uh, man accused a Christian of blaspheming the Prophet Muhammad. The Christian man was severely beaten, then some members of the Muslim community were reportedly planning to set him on fire but he managed to escape. Coming up, a pro-family advocate from the tiny nation of Georgia tells us why he's determined to fight for the faith. Hello, I'm Terry Newsom. 
Did you know there are more than 148 million orphans in the world today? 148 million. But it was three little girls that taught me about the plight of orphans. Eight years ago, my husband and I spent nearly a month immersed in the daily activities of a Ukrainian orphanage as we waited to adopt three sisters. I saw firsthand the utter loneliness, the pain of rejection, and the overwhelming desire to be loved. That experience changed me forever. And out of it grew a ministry from my heart called Orphan's Promise. Today, we're helping orphans and vulnerable children in more than 50 countries worldwide. Thousands of children are now in safe homes. They're being educated and they're learning life skills. I'm asking you to join with me and become family to these children. Will you call the number on your screen right now? Because every child deserves a chance to be happy. Inside every child is a hero, a leader, a friend to others, someone who helps out, who does the right thing, who dreams of what they can be, but they still need our help. What should I do? What should I say? How should I feel? That's where Superbook comes in. It provides moral and spiritual truths through situations children can relate to, teaching God's Word to the children you love. Join the Superbook DVD Club and receive Superbook's newest episodes as they're available, plus two copies to share with others, all for your gift of only $25. Get Superbook today and watch the miracles happen. And welcome back to Christian World News. The Republic of Georgia is one of the oldest Christian countries in the world. For centuries, numerous empires have tried to eliminate Christianity there. Now Georgia faces a new challenge to its values and its faith. This time from the United States and Europe. 25 years after the collapse of the Soviet Union, Georgia's prime minister says forging ties with the West is in his country's best interest. There is a very clear will of Georgian people and population to be pro-Western, to be pro-European. The tiny nation of Georgia lies between Russia and Turkey, while the majority here favor closer ties. We are not saying we are against West. I always say I'm a big enthusiast of selective Westernization of Georgia. Many like Lovan Vazadze insist the opening must not happen at the expense of Georgia's faith and family values. We'll take all the productive, progressive things from you, but we'll throw in garbage all the nonsense. And unfortunately, in this particular case, this means your current pseudo-moral standards need to stay outside of Georgia. Vasadze is a prominent Georgian businessman and pro-family advocate. The pseudo-moral standards he refers to are efforts by the U.S. and E.U. to force Georgia into accepting homosexual practices and same-sex marriage as societal norms. If you think indecent, radically sexual behavior is what you want to do, that's your choice. But if I think that this is an embarrassing sin, I want to remain in society which is allowed to say that. Much to his dismay, the Georgian parliament, under pressure from the European Union and with help from international pro-gay groups, passed a controversial law in 2014 making it illegal to discriminate against people on the basis of their sexual orientation. Vazadze says the decision amounted to the legalization of homosexuality in Georgia. You say this law is part of an international agenda. What is that agenda? To destroy a family. I, I believe the front line of this war is in every living room and in every bedroom where your wife and my wife, our children, sleep. The front line is now spreading to Georgian classrooms, with children as young as eight being taught gender theory. To somehow alter and change... Tina Tin Khorbaladze is director of a pro-family organization. She says the aim is simple yet alarming to change the thinking of the children, to be open and to accept the things that 
still my generation and elder generation consider to be not really acceptable. Georgia is deeply conservative. More than 80% of the population here say they belong to the Orthodox Church, and polls show a majority side with the Church in opposing anything other than traditional heterosexual relationships. We feel the responsibility for the future of this country, for the future of our children and next generation. But not everyone agrees with the church's stance on marriage. Some human rights groups have labeled this country one of the most homophobic nations in the world. Are you afraid for your life? Um, As for me personally, yes, because my life is in danger in Georgia, and not just because of my sexual orientation, but because of my professional activities as well. Georgi Tatashvili is transgender. He rarely gives interviews, but agreed to meet with CBN News at an undisclosed location in the capital. He is a lawyer for the LGBT community and says he has paid a price for it. They've arrested you, they've beaten you. Yes, many times I was beaten by policemen, ordinary citizens, and in general for many people. Tatashvili made headlines earlier this year when he became the first person ever to file a suit with the Constitutional Court seeking same-sex marriage. The lawsuit is still pending. A majority of Georgians today believe that what you're doing, your lifestyle, is sinful. And they say that you are destroying their country. I think that this is the case, and I'm not surprised people feel this way. The principles of secularism are practically violated in Georgia. The Orthodox Church puts so much pressure on the society to make sure Georgian human rights are not extended to include LGBT people. Meanwhile, Levan Vazadze worries the pressure to become more accepting of homosexuality in Georgia will only intensify following last year's controversial Supreme Court decision legalizing same-sex marriage in America. He bemoans the fact that since the ruling, many in America are too afraid to speak out against homosexuality. You can no longer freely express your opinion about what's shameful and what is disgraceful, and you are uh, crucified for that. The whole concept of sin is being abolished. Where is it? Uh, the metamorphosis in English language is staggering. I studied it since I was a child, and I remember that shame meant shame. In modern English, when someone says it's a shame, he or she means it's a pity. So we see a gutting of the concept of shame. Vazadze is praying Georgia never reaches that point. He's urging his fellow countrymen to be bold in proclaiming the truth in love. Is it your opinion that the church in Georgia, Christians in Georgia like yourself, are in the end going to determine the future of your country? What else? Of course. That's it. Nothing else. And for more on uh, Levan Vazadze's interview, you can go to our website at cbnnews.com. Well, folks, still ahead on Christian World News, celebrating Pentecost with a new outreach. See the groups that are joining forces to bring the good news to the lost. Heaven, I hasn't seen, neither has ear heard, what God has prepared for them that love Him. There'll be no more tears. There'll be no more sorrow. There'll be no more suffering. That's why we want to be part of it. Heaven, what God has prepared for those who love Him. Get this newest DVD teaching from Pat Robertson. Available now. Hello, I'm Terry Newsom. Did you know there are more than 148 million orphans in the world today? 148 million. But it was three little girls that taught me about the plight of orphans. Eight years ago, my husband and I spent nearly a month immersed in the daily activities of a Ukrainian orphanage as we waited to adopt three sisters. I saw firsthand the utter loneliness, the pain of rejection, and the overwhelming desire to be loved. That experience changed me forever. And out of it grew a ministry from my heart called Orphan's Promise. Today, we're helping orphans and vulnerable children in more than 50 countries worldwide. Thousands of children are now in safe homes. They're being educated. 
and they're learning life skills. I'm asking you to join with me and become family to these children. Will you call the number on your screen right now? Because every child deserves a chance to be happy. Kids, we want them to grow up knowing God's Word. But in today's busy world, sometimes we could use some help. The free Superbook Kids Bible app has fun stuff your kids will love. They'll have a blast learning the Bible, playing great games, watching cool videos, right, follow me. discovering heroes in the Bible. They'll have fun while they learn God's Word. The Superbook Kids Bible app, available on iTunes and the Google Play Store. Christians around the world celebrate Pentecost Sunday on May 15th, marking the birth of the Christian Church. And this year, there's a new unified movement to rekindle the spirit of Pentecost by taking the gospel of Jesus to the farthest corners of the earth. Churches, missions groups, and Christian media are joining forces to reach out to more than 2.5 billion people who've never heard the gospel. Even more, 5 billion have never met a true follower of Jesus. A representative of the largest missions association in North America recently spoke with CBN News. There are billions of people in the world today that still have yet to hear the name of Jesus Christ in the context that he's the savior of the world. And therefore, those 2.5 billion people still need a clear presentation of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And so we see it really as a a really oversight or a crime against humanity that these people have yet to hear the gospel message proclaimed to them in a way that's understandable to them. By the way, this is the inaugural year for the International Day for the Unreached. To find out more, including how you can get involved, go to our website, cbnnews.com. Israel said thank you to hundreds of evangelical Christians standing by its side. The Israeli embassy in Washington, D.C. hosted its 15th annual Christian Solidarity event. CBN's principal representative to Israel, Michael Little, was there. He said Christians and Jews must stand together against groups around the world who want Israel to stop being a nation in the Middle East. The roots of anti-Semitism uh, go to those who have sided with the enemy of our souls. It's uh, the destroyer himself is at the root of this and is using groups of people today who oppose Israel because of their own selfish reasons. One of the best ways to deal with anti-Semitism is the word of God, to be believed as the word of God and taken and used as the word of God. And as you read it, it gives you the history of the Jewish people. The event also included appearances from Ron Dermer, the Israel ambassador to the United States, and also Dr. Richard Land, the president of the Southern Evangelical Seminary. When we come back, a Chinese pastor who paid a high price for speaking out, see how his church rewarded his courage. Join the 700 Club and get your copy of Heaven, the newest teaching by Pat Robertson. You're going to see some amazing stories of people who have died and gone to heaven. I was free. I wasn't afraid. I could feel peace from head to my toe. I'll also be talking with a renowned cardiac surgeon. How many of your patients died and came back to life again? Dozens have in fact died and have experienced heaven. Call 1-800-759-0700 to get your copy of Heaven, what God has prepared for those who love Him. And then I'll be sharing the Bible answers to some of the most important questions people have about eternity. Pat, are we eternal beings? Do we live when this life is over? That's what the Bible says. There's no question that we are not extinguished at death, but our spirits will live on forever. Get your copy of Pat Robertson's newest teaching, Heaven, available now. To hit middle school and start having same-sex attractions was just very confusing because I had accepted the Lord when I was a little girl. Right in the middle of this holiness code is a reference to homosexual practice. I don't think Christians have anything to fear from research, from science done well. They're like, oh, this is awful. You don't let him in the house, do you? Life. It's meant to be lived fully. 
Jesus said it, I came to give you life, life to the fullest, life in your family, life in your finances, life in your body, mind, and spirit, life in your everyday. At CBN.com, we're taking what Jesus said seriously. We're here to help you discover life. Life, live it fully. CBN.com. And welcome back to the broadcast. Members of a Chinese church are glad to have their pastor back home. Pastor Zhang Zhongshu received a hero's welcome after spending 240 days in jail. Zhang spoke out against a campaign uh, against churches by the provincial government in Xinjiang province. Authorities there have destroyed several churches and torn down hundreds of crosses from church buildings. However, inspired by Pastor Zhang's release, Chinese Christians say they will not stop fighting for religious freedom and their faith. Many Chinese churches uh, are seeking to bless their country. Since China is one of the fastest developing countries in the world, it needs the help. One social challenge where churches are making a difference is serving the growing number of senior citizens. Meng Fei Li has the story. It is estimated there will be 400 million people over the age of 60 and more than 94 million over the age of 80 by the year 2021. This growing population presents a burden on society, especially for the children, but an unlikely solution is presenting itself, as many more older Chinese people are joining churches. For some Chinese seniors, coming to church is a new experience, but they enjoy being with others and are open to hearing about Jesus. Before coming to church, I was alone while my children were away. I was so afraid of the loneliness. Today, I'm surrounded with church elders. I'm having fun in church and getting to know God. Working-age children are moving to the cities for work, and they bring their parents with them. Now, churches in large cities in China are recognizing this mission field and reaching out to the seniors through daytime activities. I am very pleased to start this ministry. It gives the church greater opportunities to know the local community members. Not everyone believes in Jesus, but we try to emphasize that we care about them and they are not alone. Jesus is always with them. Recently, church leaders start to notice more and more younger Chinese people start to join the worship services. Mainly, they are invited by their elderly parents to join the Chinese Christian community. Older Chinese are slow to embrace Christianity, royal to the old ways, but local churches are working hard to get them involved in church activities through ministry and worship events. In this way, the Chinese Christian community is hoping to reach this important part of the Chinese society. Meng Fei Li for CBN News. Thanks so much for joining us this week. Until next week, goodbye and God bless you.